Welcome to section seven of Microbiology Fundamentals. In this section, we'll be discussing viral genetics. Let's get started. Here's a table listing genetic activities of viruses, and some of them can alter the genome, which you can see with these top three examples, and some do not alter the genome. Let's start by discussing recombination. This is the simplest form of genetic activity, and it's simply the crossing over of two viral genomes. And this crossing over occurs at homologous regions of the chromosomes. We typically refer to the viral genomes as nucleic acids or genomes, and not so much chromosomes, but I like to use the word chromosomes here because recombination has a C and chromosomes has a C. So you can think of recombination as crossing over of chromosomes. So a third C. So recombination, crossing over of chromosomes. And if the actual genes have recombined, then has the viral genome been altered? Yes, it has. Now let's discuss reassortment or genetic shift. This occurs when segmented viruses exchange genetic material. When segments reassort themselves, a new, more virulent virus can form. And this is considered a shift in the genetics or antigens, so genetic shift. Here is a diagram showing genetic shift and genetic drift. Right now we're going to focus on the left portion, genetic shift. As you can see, virus A has eight segments of purple colored RNA strands, whereas virus B has eight pink colored RNA strands. In other words, the two genomes are drastically different from one another. Before we go any further, influenza is the most notable example of genetic shift. So as we move through this diagram, have influenza in the back of your mind. Now notice that in this example, we've stated that virus A has the capability of infecting humans, whereas virus B infects animals, such as birds or pigs. Occasionally, these two drastically different viruses can infect the same cell and exchange genetic information. This is known as reassortment. Notice that if this occurs, then a new virus is produced, which we've indicated as virus C. Because many of the elements from virus A were maintained, this novel virus still has the ability to infect humans. Genetic shift is a very dangerous process because the novel virus is so unique that it can evade the immune system and infect many people. This is why genetic shift is known to cause pandemics, which are widespread infections that may affect entire countries or even the entire world. Now returning to our table and looking at reassortment or genetic shift, has the genome been altered? The answer is yes. Those segmented viruses have totally reassorted, and that new novel strain can cause pandemics, especially due to flu viruses. Now let's talk about random mutation. We can also call this genetic drift. This is far less dangerous than genetic shift. Yes, it's an alteration to the genome, but it's a slow and gradual change. So it doesn't cause pandemics like you'd see with genetic shift. Coming back to this image, we can focus on the right now and see genetic drift. We see that random mutations occur over time, and we can see the result is this tiny little alteration here, represented by that yellow mark. And if you compare that small yellow change to genetic shift over here, you can see that the change with virus C over here is far bigger than this small change over here. Now let's talk about phenotypic mixing. With phenotypic mixing, the genome is not altered. In fact, phenotypic mixing can be described as an accidental and temporary relationship. And these notes are here for your reference, but it's actually best to describe this using a diagram. So here's our phenotypic mixing diagram. Virus A and virus B will infect the same host cell, and they both replicate inside the cell, and their progeny can have their genotypes and phenotypes mismatched, hence the term phenotypic mixing. So here's what this looks like. As you can see below, the progeny, we will call hybrid progeny, has the surface proteins of virus B. This would be called the phenotype but it has the genome of virus A. This would be called the genotype. These new hybrid progeny can then go and infect a new cell. And that's because of these virus B surface proteins. And once that virus A genome enters that cell, it will replicate and the progeny will look like the normal virus A. As you can see, it has the phenotype or the surface proteins of virus A again. So we can see that the relationship between virus A and B was temporary and more or less accidental. An example of phenotypic mixing is an HIV capsid with its nucleic acids within a rhabdovirus envelope. So the genotype would be HIV, but the phenotype would be considered rhabdovirus. So what's the significance of a relationship like this? Well, the surface proteins or coproteins from rhabdovirus can allow HIV to invade cells that it otherwise couldn't. So the rabies virus allows the HIV genome to enter a cell, and then the HIV virus can replicate from there. Keep in mind, this is kind of an unusual and unique example, so you don't think of HIV as being covered with rabies all the time. In fact, most of the time it isn't, but although rare, this exemplifies phenotypic mixing. 
One important term to associate with phenotypic mixing is tropism. Tropism determines which cells or tissues the virus can infect. Going back to the image, those surface proteins from virus B allowed the virus A genome to enter host cells that it normally couldn't. In other words, the tropism of virus A expanded. Now let's talk about complementation. Complementation shares several features of phenotypic mixing. For example, with complementation, the genome of the virus is not altered. Basically, complementation can be thought of as a dependent relationship. What will happen is virus A and virus B will infect the same cell. Basically, virus A will provide products necessary for virus B to infect or replicate. In other words, virus B is now infectious because of virus A. However, it continually depends on virus A. The best example of complementation is hepatitis D. Hepatitis D depends on the hepatitis B surface antigen for adsorption. So therefore, hepatitis B complements hepatitis D. This image depicts complementation with hepatitis B and hepatitis D. This is discussed in great detail within the hepatitis D lecture in the viruses chapter. Briefly, notice that hepatitis B is infecting a liver hepatocyte, and it releases progeny with its hepatitis B surface antigen, which you can see here. Now you can see hepatitis D over here, and these antigens then allow hepatitis D to enter the hepatocyte. However, if hepatitis D came along and it wasn't coated with those surface antigens, it wouldn't be able to enter and infect the hepatocyte. Therefore, hepatitis D is dependent on hepatitis B. Now, complementation and phenotypic mixing are very similar. If you ever get confused on an exam, just think about one of the two viruses in the relationship, the one that receives the protein products, and then ask yourself this question, can that virus be infectious without the other virus? If the answer is yes, it can be infectious, then you know you're dealing with phenotypic mixing. If the answer is no, it cannot be infectious without the presence of that other virus, then you're dealing with complementation because complementation is a dependent relationship. Now that we've covered the information in the table, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. Researchers isolate a virus, virus A, capable of invading and replicating within human pharyngeal tissue only. Pharyngeal tissue infected with virus A is examined and researchers confirm the presence of a second virus, virus B. Virus B is capable of infecting pharyngeal and intestinal tissues. Virus A and B have non-segmented genomes. Viral progeny from the pharyngeal tissue have the nucleic acids of virus A with surface proteins from virus B. Which term best describes the hybrid progeny? A. Genetic shift. B. Altered tropism. C. Dependence. D. Genomic change. Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that virus A is capable of invading and replicating within human pharyngeal tissue. So we know that virus A is able to complete its life cycle in the absence of other viruses. You could call it an independent virus. We also know that virus B, in addition to being able to invade pharyngeal tissue, can invade intestinal tissues. This statement highlights the tropism or the range of tissues that virus B can infect. Then we learn that the surface proteins from virus B are used on the surface of virus A progeny, the hybrid progeny. This indicates that the tropism of virus A progeny has altered. With these new proteins, virus A can now invade pharyngeal and intestinal tissues. So the correct answer is B, altered tropism. This can occur with phenotypic mixing. Recall our diagram for phenotypic mixing, and we can see that the virus A genome, or the hybrid progeny, is now coated by the virus B proteins. Therefore, it can infect new cells. Being able to infect new cells that it couldn't before refers to tropism. You could say that its tropism has expanded, or at least altered. But once the genome gets inside the cell, it will replicate and produce normal or original virus A. Now choice A is wrong because genetic shift refers to reassortment. And reassortment only occurs with segmented viruses, for example, influenza. Choice C is wrong because dependence refers to complementation. And we know that virus A is capable of completing its life cycle without any other viruses, so it is not dependent. Thus, the relationship between the two viruses in this question stem does not represent complementation. Lastly, choice D is wrong because the altered tropism is temporary, not a permanent genomic change. Recall from the table that phenotypic mixing and complementation do not alter the genome. So again, the correct answer is B, altered tropism.